All right, hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker, and this is a uh, another fan request episode. I received at least four fan requests. Now, two of them are related to the Shroud from um, a couple of pro Shroud friends of mine. And um, we've, I'm going to separate those from this episode and we're going to be working on those at a future time. Uh, so um, that's going to be on my uh, Shroud Panel Review Summary Show Part 2B. A couple experts have some uh, objections and updates and uh, helpful feedback for you guys. So we're going to set that up and I'll post that up at some point later on once that's uh, finished and I get some time. In the meantime, uh, everyone's uh, favorite uh, fan here, uh, Harry Stark, has made a couple of recommendations. So in the first place, he's edited my recent personal testimony on the Reason and Theology podcast and uh, I guess he's updated it. Uh, he shortened it or sped it up, so it's only 35 minutes, and he's kind of cleaned up the slides so that it's easier to read and stuff like that. So uh, I promised him I would post up that version if that works better for you guys, for people than the full show version and stuff. I'm obviously keeping the full version up because that's my favorite. That's where I get the Q and A's and uh, the full the full effect and stuff like that. But um, yeah, if anyone had trouble reading my slides, as Harry was mentioning, he's uh, done the work to help me uh, fix that up. So I'm going to post that up. That'll be right afterwards, uh, after what I'm about to say. The, the other thing is, uh, related to personal testimonies, Harry Stark has also asked me to look at a recent unbelievable appearance, and he's done an, a 15-minute edit of that uh, recent episode of uh, a former agnostic uh, turned Christian, just like myself. Uh, Carolyn Weber. Um, so he wants me to review that 15 minute clip. So that's what I'm going to do first. And then afterwards, I'll put on, I'll tag at the end Harry Stark's uh, edited uh, video of me on the Reason and Theology podcast. Okay, so let me share my screen here. Gotcha. And I will mute and you can have a listen to the first five minutes or so. Carolyn Webber is an award-winning author, professor, and international speaker. Carolyn's first memoir, Surprised by Oxford, recently became a fabulous feature film. And both the book and the film tell her story of coming to faith from scepticism, a journey that in so many ways mirrors C.S. Lewis's own. Would you mind just giving us a little brief summary of some of your story and I guess, you know, some of the reasons that sort of led you to Christianity? Because you were also, as we said, pursuing the truth in the way that Dan was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we're both truth seekers in that sense and very... um opposite story in this in a way i mean i had i came from a very loving home too uh but um but broken as well um i mean i don't think those two are antithetical either but uh when when i was about seven or eight my father was a self-made man i came from immigrant backgrounds and he had lost his business um and had been very affluent and ended up having um, a mental breakdown as a result and my mother was raising us as a single mom so my father was in and out of our lives i was kind of from a, a mid-sized town um in canada uh not particularly you know, well off and middle class. And, um, but as my mom struggled to raise us, uh, we were, of course, more poor in a sense. Um, and eventually, my father came in and out of our lives in volatile ways. Um, my mom was very loving and, and very uh, artistic and very intelligent, as was my dad in his own ways, too. But um, she was, uh, she drank heavily um, in order to, um, I think, deal with her, the things that she was dealing with. And I would have, I probably would have drank more. <laughs> so, um, so I was raising my, helping to raise my my sibling and my um, participate financially supporting our family. There was a lot of financial duress. And to make a long story short on my end, I just, I, I had sort of been exposed perhaps to a loose Catholicism, European Catholicism as a child from my grandparents. I was very close to my grandmother, um, but attended things in mass and Latin, didn't really understand. Uh, my mom would have been probably loosely Catholic with some guidelines there, but really by the time I was entering into my teens, um, I didn't have any kind of religious framework at all. I'm a perfect example of somebody who went through the public school system without really cracking open a Bible. Um, reading the Bible as, as I needed to. Um, I, I won scholarships and things like that throughout the way uh, to pursue literary studies and had to read it as I needed to, to understand allusions and things. But um, I didn't really, uh, I, I really believed in self-sufficiency and personal responsibility and pulling oneself up by their bootstraps and making my own way. And I certainly wasn't going to um, believe in the crux of religion uh, or believe in an eternal father when your earthly one is not dependable. Um, and and yet I wouldn't have defined myself as, as atheist. I, I, I by my teens, I, I define myself basically as agnostic because I couldn't disprove God either. So um, I wasn't quite sure which way. And I was probably, in a sense, a fence sitter, uh, although to some degree, I had just really never been asked the question um, who Jesus was. For me, my 
I would say, and even who God was. I would say also a great example, particularly of sort of our mainstream society of somebody whose idea of Jesus was a big hair TV evangelist who took your money. Um, I made fun of people exactly like yourself in your childhood. <laughs> um, I thought uh, things like end times and that were ridiculous and spiritual warfare is not really pleasant in Canadian conversation. And there, there wasn't really any um, reason to land there. And what had happened is uh, I only knew, I, I knew C.S. Lewis as a child through the Narnia Chronicles. I hadn't really known him in any other way, shape or form. But as I arrived at Oxford University on a Commonwealth scholarship for my graduate work, I was studying world religions for my MPhil at the time and um, various uh, theologies around the world as they were dovetailing into the 19th century um, and into British and European romanticism. And, uh, and I just was, I was really interested in progress of the soul theories. And I, so I was reading widely in that sense, but I began to meet Christians and I met Christians from all over the world um, at Oxford in ways that I didn't anticipate. I had people start to ask me these questions. I'd always been very busy surviving, um, working hard and multiple jobs and keeping my grades up and that sort of thing. And, and I never actually had been asked thoroughly and thoughtfully who God was to me. Uh, and I started to examine that. Um, and as I did, I was drawn more and more towards Christianity. Uh, partly Lewis was influential in that way, but actually first and foremost, it was the example of thoughtful Christians, people I met who were really living their faith um, meaningfully and kindly and um, thoughtfully. Uh, to me, reason and faith seemed antithetical and necessarily antithetical. And uh, paradox to me had to be a contradiction, not an apparent one. And, um, and yet the more conversations I had, and of course these people were human too, and, uh, but the more this was becoming incredibly inconvenient. <laughs> and so I finally decided to read the Bible for myself, cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, um, because I knew lots of people who had a Darwin fish on the back of their car and had never cracked open the Bible for themselves. And that's not how I operated and how I did in my studies. And, um, and when I really, really read Genesis carefully, it again was also horrendously inconvenient because it really made sense. Um, sin made sense. Pride made sense. Uh, God is other, and the preference of other made sense. And that was really annoying. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, my first, my, I guess my thoughts on the first five minutes or so there, she, she raised a lot of things. So very interesting. She, like me, she was a agnostic, although she kind of grew up in this state of agnosticism, or at least when she was a teenager, and very little intellectual exposure to Christianity or uh, looking at Christianity and taking it seriously. It never even read the Bible and that sort of thing. And uh, I think it just goes to show you uh, once she actually put her money where her mouth was and started reading the word of God, um, the truth was revealed. The Holy Spirit testified to her. And um, I think that's, uh, you know, proof in the pudding. There's a lot of internet atheists that are totally ignorant and clueless, uh, you know, um, They've never read the Bible. They have any don't have any clue what it actually says, apart from oh, let's type in 101 Google on Google 101 Bible contradictions. Oh, I'm now a Bible scholar and stuff like that. And you know they have no clue about the easy refutations that Christ, educated Christians have come up with. Um, however, I would say that I mean obviously there are atheists and stuff that are actually informed of a more academic nature. They have read the Bible. They have. Uh, given some serious thought and they sincerely disagree and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Um, so I think that the main thing here is that once she read the Bible, uh, she, she realized, look, intellectually, faith and reason are not uh, paradoxical or contradictory to each other. They can be harmonized. They make perfect, Genesis makes perfect sense. Her work, Carolyn's words, uh, the story of sin, the fall and sin and the atonement of Jesus, it, it clicks. Yes, this, of course, this is the only way the truth could be. This is, this is what the truth is and stuff like that. So there is that properly basic belief. I think that she had by the inner witness or testimony of the Holy spirit when she read the Bible. Um, so yeah, it, it works folks. Um, don't let the cynics and atheists and skeptics and stuff like that kind of mock you or deride you. Um, it does work. Uh, for some people, they just, you know, reading the Bible, reading the word of God, it's a living dynamic word and it speaks to people. Um, ne anyone, whether they profess to be a Christian or not, who derides or denigrates or diminishes and belittles the impact of reading the word of God. I don't, um, yeah, uh, there's something wrong with that person. Run, run away. They're not intellectually honest. They're not a, 
um, a scholarly person. They're not someone interested sincerely in truth. They have an agenda. Don't listen to that person. You look into things for yourself. Okay. Um, well, that's it. I mean, there, there isn't really anything else um, that I can uh, say here. So let's listen to some more of her uh, testimony. I was prepared for it to not make sense and to use the Bible as fodder for my argument against my Christian friends and um, for Christians in general, um, who as a category can be their own worst enemy. And uh, and so um, I ended up, as I read it through, realized that Genesis really, really in fascinating ways um, rolled out to Revelation. And like Goethe says, I have not the imagination for reality. And I actually found it very compelling um, as a human story. And um, and of course, there are things that are weird. And of course, there are things that are bizarre. Um, but those are everywhere. It offered a coherent narrative. Uh, Christianity itself offered a coherent narrative. There are things about God that we can know. And there are things about God that are unknowable. Um, I didn't find that to deny his existence. And um, I was also a feminist. I still am in many ways in various shades and things as well. Um, but Jesus was here historically. Um, we have documentation of that. Um, something happened. Um, but what fascinated me too was the power of story that um, the Bible had something else going on underneath it. And it was, I ended up agreeing with someone like Bonhoeffer that the Bible is unlike any other text. And I'm not saying that I open it and, you know, I was very, very hesitant and very um, cynical or skeptical towards a, a holy Bible. Um, but uh, there was something else that was happening in the reading. And um, I really began to understand and, and seek to understand further how we are humanetical thinkers, how we are looking for various levels of truth many things that either the surface is the surface and there's nothing else beneath it or above or there is and uh and there might be multiple things happening at the same time some of which we can see some of which we cannot and i couldn't deny the more i read the bible as as a lover of reading the more i realized what's going on um in my own heart and in my own mind but also that both made sense and um and also invited um beyond that and so i eventually became a christian uh, a few years later Carolyn, just before the break, we were talking a bit about your story and you, like Lewis, were somewhat reluctant to become a Christian, weren't you? I mean, obviously, I'm surprised by Joy Lewis talks about being the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. Is, is that sort of how you felt when you became a Christian? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I actually felt that way, kicking and screaming prior to the actual sort of handing my life over. But um, what I love about Lewis's description is he says the after effect of looking back at that and realizing that a God that would still accept someone on those terms, right? Still the pride in that sort of realization. Um, but I think ultimately for me, it was really the city of God, the city of man bumping up against each other. And in that, there was something more I wanted and wanted in the double-edged sword sense of both lacking and wanting and needing, desiring. And and so um, I I didn't read Lewis. I didn't know about Surprised by Joy to the same extent at all until later. So I, I eventually read more of his works later, but I really resonated with the fact that here I am an academic, here I am from really a background of predominantly um, unbelievers or or people who also think of themselves perhaps culturally as Christian, but because they are good or they're nice. Uh, and uh, and this was going to be, um, again, just very inconvenient. And uh, and so I think that's more of where my sort of kicking and screaming came from. But there was also an element of help me in my unbelief. And even that was in the Bible. I mean, what I was amazed by is there's something for everyone in the Bible, every single facet of ourselves, as well as different people. So within and without, and that was one of the lowliest of prayers. And I still got to this point, much like Sheldon Van and I had read A Severe Mercy and um, had been struck by that. That was actually my first introduction to Lewis and um, out of the Narnia Chronicles folder. And uh, where he talked about not being able eventually for him, being able to reject who Jesus was. It was more of a falling back than a leaping forward. And I think that's really, in a sense, the place that I was at. And I wouldn't have described it as very comfortable. <laughs> um, and, and I guess the other sort of clear mirroring of some of Lewis's story was was that sort of the search for joy, which is which is what he calls it. Okay, uh, so just to kind of come come in and uh, at this point, hold on, Let's see if that uh, goodness. Okay, well, whatever. Um, one thing that I find interesting here is my notion of the real seeker. Uh, so I have this notion that you have to be open, sincerely open minded doing your best to actively seek out the truth and uh, be willing to follow or obey the truth in whatever uh, way is appropriate once you discover it in order for God to reveal the truth to you. 
Now, her Carolyn's testimony seems to contradict that, right? Oh, no, she wasn't actively seeking. She was actually closed-minded to God and wasn't seeking God and was reluctant to even believe. But I think that uh, we need to probe a little bit further beyond just the superficial words that they're saying, because obviously she was open-minded. She was willing to obey because once she read the Bible and realized the truth, she submitted. She's a Christian. So she was that. She wasn't uh, reluctant, as she says. And I think she was, she mentioned and gives, gives the game away that she was a real seeker. She was seeking something beyond this ultimate purpose beyond. Um, and she was finding that in the Bible, the, the hidden depths within the pages of it hinting that there's something more out there. And, you know, she was saying that she wanted it and desired this ultimate purpose and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, sometimes I think people can say, well, I on a conscious level, I was totally closed-minded to the Christian God. But I think what they really mean there is I was closed-minded to what I thought was the Christian God, right? Like, I, you know, for example, I'm closed-minded to certain... Con- conceptions of the Christian God, when when atheists and skeptics uh, mischaracterize and straw man the Christian God or the God of the Bible and say, oh, he's just a brute that, you know, a, a malevolent monster who will torture innocent babies for fun. And, you know, he just likes, he uh, gets off on killing people and stuff like that. I would never worship that God. I'm closed minded to that God. I am not a real seeker. I refuse to follow an evil God. But Fortunately for me, is I'm a real seeker with respect to, but is the God of the Bible really like that? Or are the atheists just making stuff up about the God of the Bible? And that's what I think happened with Carol, Carolyn here. Um, is she once she read the Bible for herself, she realized her previous atheists and agnostics were just totally ignorant about what the God of the Bible, the Christian God, truly is. And she, once she realized how wonderful that is, that's where she um, committed herself like a real seeker to the truth and that sort of thing. So um, I think, yeah, um, that's the only thing there I wanted to say about that is that um, she doesn't actually contradict my real seeker notion. So let's get back to what she has to say. And, um, you know, you say in Surprise by Oxford, your book, joy is the Christian secret weapon. No one else has it in such abundance. And I guess in many ways that kind of mimics a lot of what Lewis says in his work. So in The Great Divorce, he says, here is joy that cannot be shaken. And um, in Surprise by Joy, he says, I sometimes wonder whether all pleasures are not substitutes for joy. So you, you kind of see this this reoccurring theme of, of searching for joy. But was that something that was true in your story as well, Carolyn? Well, I think it was the longing and that, um, I mean, I did see a joy in Christians and it was different than happiness right, um, which is circumstantial. And it was different than pleasure, which, you know, is weird or gross. So there is a sense in which, uh, or physical, you know, it was um, when he talked about all joy reminds, there was this way in which, uh, see, because he, he borrowed that title from Wordsworth. And um, I was, you know, a romanticist at the time, that was my area of study. And um, Surprised by Joy is a poem by Wordsworth in which actually he experiences joy in the face of great grief, in the, in the face of loss, he's experienced something beautiful for a moment or deeply that, that creates this longing in himself. And he turns to share it with somebody and realizes that that tomb is empty and it will always be empty. And um, and I think for Lewis to evoke that title is really interesting because it, it not only that sense of something that we have lost and yet we are longing for pointing us to something else, all those desires pointing to a greater desire, but also um, that even something like grief or loss, pain, suffering, an empty tomb would be a source for something in which we are actually both painfully and, and, and joyfully feeling. Um, and that that there was something longing, we all long for, uh, that I felt to be really common to the human condition, what it meant to be human, and that I felt to myself as well. Well, I think that idea of a moral or natural law, right, in the sense that there is um, some universal sense in which we are attracted to what seems wrong. I mean, um, which would be at the roots of something like rights or judgment um, or deciding what is good or bad, um, you know, whether to murder or not, whether to have any kind of rights in our society or not, do have those Judean Christian roots. But I think what's really probably for me most compelling about a writer like Lewis that will always remain relevant is he gets me to think about the questions God is asking of me, is asking of us. So that we're asking questions all the time, but we're also being asked questions. And I'm not saying that this is from a big booming cosmic voice, but I'm saying that, you know, within ourselves, that very first question in Genesis, you know, where are you? It's not that we, God went missing, it's we did. Um, what do you want? What do you want? 
Um, and the blind man is, asks to see and the disciples ask to follow. And he says, I'll show you. They follow him and he shows them the way. Um, who do you say I am? Um, who do you say I am? And being truthful with yourself. It's not about the person to the left or your right. It's you. Who do you, who do you say I am? Um, what consequences does that have for therefore how you make your decisions, how you shape your concept of, of reason and, and personal responsibility? Um, and, and do you love me? Um, and Okay, so a couple interesting points here in what uh, Carolyn's saying. Um, Carolyn, right? Let me double check. Yes, Carolyn. Um, so first point, uh, so she mentioned that there's this uh, a fundamental joy corresponding to our ultimate purpose, and that's different than happiness or mere pleasure. Um, I, I think that happiness and pleasure are important expressions and manifestations of this fundamental joy that she's talking about. Uh, it's what Christians call bliss, and that's what us, the Christian salvation offers you. That's what the Bible is offering you as your ultimate purpose, this bliss, uh, state of pure bliss um, in an eternal loving relationship with God and everyone else who chooses to turn to God and repent of their sins as well. Um, so that's the most amazing fundamental thing that we could ever desire and want and She's saying that's that's what this God-shaped hole was for her in, in her heart as an agnostic, that she realized the Bible's providing her the answer to get. And all of us have it, whether you you know claim to deny it or not, you really do have this because we've all been, as humans, designed to want this and to desire this state of bliss, uh, this joy, uh, contentment and joy that Christians have that uh, other atheists and skeptics uh, just don't have um, and that sort of thing. They they can experience happiness and pleasure, but um, no one can experience outside of Christ this real, uh, real sense of joy and bliss um, that we have. So, yeah, um, I think that's uh, an interesting point. Um, there's a second point. Uh, I know she brings up morality. So, okay, I agree with her that God makes sense of morality and she talks about you know well why do we have kind of temporary sinful lusts in the moment and stuff like that like i want i desire to do something sinful or bad and she says the christian story makes total sense of that with the story of sin and the fall um and uh yeah uh she made another major point um hang on one second let me just remind myself it's not that we God went missing, it's needed. Um, what do you want? Oh, that's right. Yeah. So um, I think it was very telling, you know, when she's like asking these fundamental worldview questions, you know, like, what do you want? Who do you say that I am? Um, and do you love me? The, these fundamental questions from a Christian perspective that everyone is responsible to give a sincere, genuine, thoughtful answer and engage in critical thought before they give this answer you know and i think it's telling who do you you know who do you say that i am as jesus says um you know you you can't just give some little pat answer well oh i'm an atheist so the talking point from matt dillahunty today is uh, x y and z or oh well i'm a christian so i'm supposed to answer this way no, uh, Jesus tells us to get real. Look, who do you, at the end of the day, you are responsible for you. So get real, atheist. Who do you really say that I am? Don't just try to sound smart and intelligent and, and stuff. You're not. Compared to me, I'm God. I, I will kick your rumps in any IQ test any day. Just get real with me. Come on. Who do you say that I am? I will meet you where you're at. And I will, if you just be a real seeker, I will show you that truth. Um... So, yeah, I think, I think that that's a very interesting point that, um, you know, you have to be willing to engage in that real talk, that self-examination that Paul tells all Christians to do, but also atheists and skeptics are responsible to do that as well with respect to the, the question of Jesus and who they think he is and why they think um, the way they do about him and that sort of thing. So, I, yeah, those were the a couple points that I found interesting what she said. Uh, so let's listen to the last four minutes, and I'll give my ending thoughts on this. What do you want? 
um, and the blind man is, asks to see, and the disciples ask to follow, and he says, I'll show you, they follow him, and he shows them the way, um, who do you say I am? Um, who do you say I am? And being truthful with yourself. It's not about the person to the left or your right, it's you. Who do you, who do you say I am? Um, what consequences does that have for, therefore, how you make your decisions, how you shape your concept of, of reason and, and personal responsibility, um, and, and do you love me? Um, and even to the point of reinstating betrayal three times. So I think that there, I'm struck by how I'm always sort of um, discomfited after I read him. <laughs> so he has this uncanny ability to kind of make me feel like I'm having a pint with him in a pub or a cuppa, but I'm, and it's quite, um, you know, self-deprecating as Dan said, and quite inviting to be with him. And yet he's also asking these hard questions of ourselves and, and pointing to how God is asking those of us as well. Um, and how we answer them makes all the difference. And Carolyn, in your journey, do you think there was a specific C.S. Lewis quote or story or idea or book that really began to kind of unpick your agnosticism and move you towards Christianity. Obviously, it wasn't just C.S. Lewis that led you in that direction, but he was quite a significant part of that journey. Was there anything in particular that so resonated with you? Mm. Well, so many of his works, you know, across that range and surprised by joy, obviously, in that I think it was in many ways quite a delicate and nuanced telling of his conversion and how in many ways it can be a bit like breathing. You know, you're not a Christian when you leave for the zoo and you are when you arrive. You know, what does that mean for us? We're, we're nuanced beings. And I agree with Dan that all we are in a sense are stories. You know, we're all our stories. And um, and how how do all those stories point to this one one great story that really, you know, I mean, you really can't have a stronger or more powerful or more meaningful metaphor than something like the incarnation. But um, I really was moved by his essays, his thoughts on prayer, particularly the weight of glory, because it forced me to recognize that everyone we meet is immortal. And if I don't believe in something beyond death, the great philosophical question, what happens to us when we die? Are we gone? Are we rot? Or is there something else? Um, it's fine and good for me, but what of the person next to me? Um, love for both my God and myself, but also for my neighbor. And as he famously says, you know, there are no ordinary people and uh, everybody you meet is, is immortal. And, uh, and that, that changes our hands and how we interact with people, even when we're not in the mood. Um, it doesn't mean we're forced into fake joyousness. I think that's actually one of the most discrediting things of superficial su superficiality in any religion, but particularly Christianity. I think it makes though, all the difference between friendship and fellowship. It's not the friendship of the ring. You know, it's the fellowship of the ring. And I think it is for a reason. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be delightful or you have to be um, superficial. You can kai high and low in fellowship in a way that you can't with friendship because friendship will always stop at a certain point. Uh, and I was moved by, more than moved, I was moved in heart and mind, but I was really um, challenged and and changed by uh, by that way of thinking that forces you out of your self-referentiality. I also, I just wondered, the final lines of mere Christianity, um, I just wondered what your response was to them. It says, look for yourself and you'll find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. I just wondered whether that was your experience, Carolyn, of becoming a Christian. Uh, yes, yes, it, it was. And it continues to be. Um, that certainly there are difficult things in the Bible and difficult things even spoken by by Jesus himself, um, if, if we take those recordings. Um, and yet, I think, as Lewis says, if you're a Christian at some point, you know, there are, and he says this in the way to glory, there are very difficult things. And actually, sometimes examining the things that are most terrible and most frightening lead us to the greatest insights, um, as he discusses when he starts to think about glory. There, there is actually a lot of historical support for Jesus having been here. Um, you know, Lee Strobel's case for Christ is early convic convicting, but we have more support for for his um, life than we do for something like, um, than we do for the Odyssey, you know, which we teach in all of our freshman courses. So there's actually quite a bit of historical support. But I think what was so radical about Jesus is, um, yes, a lot of those stories, he teaches in parable, and that doesn't mean that they can't appeal to faith, but I think it means that they're not limited, um, that they can't appeal to reason, but they're not limited to reason. And parable allows for interpretation, and it allows for, and he was using those parables based on his life at the time, of course, and the audience and how they would have appealed, but they speak of things that are very still relevant to us today. Um, and so is he, is he saying to pluck out your eye? Um, I mean, if we are going to talk about literalisms, um, is he saying to cut off your hand if it offends you? Um, I don't know. Perhaps me as a, as a trained reader, I tend not to believe that that's what he's asserting. Um, I tend to think that it would be within the power of story that he came, not as a theologian, but as a storyteller, as Madeline Engel says. And uh, and that's how we glean um, the truth and the morality um, from those stories. But but uh, what he is saying is radical. He's not political. He's not advocating any nationality. He's not uh, advocating anything, even to Caesar. And he's operating in this space that's incredibly uh, unique and liminal. And he calls us to answer for our own hearts. Um, and that's a really, um, that's a question that lays one open. Okay, so that's that's uh, Carolyn Weber and her testimony, and obviously C.S. Lewis seems to be a very influential part. He wasn't really influential for me at all. I've never read C.S. Lewis, to be honest, um, and all, although all my friends uh, have read him and stuff like that as Christians, so he was obviously a great thinker of the 20th century and a very powerful uh, witness and that sort of thing from his uh, in terms of his conversion and he's made an impact in a lot of Christians lives and bringing people to Christ and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I respect the, the work that he's done and, and the uh, cause of apologetics and evangelism and stuff like that. And 
I, I take his view of mere Christianity and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really know what to say. Like, yeah, I mean, C.S. Lewis is a, as a great Christian. Um, um, yeah, and I'm glad that he spoke to her and, and brought her, helped to bring her to Christ in some way through the work of the Holy Spirit, um, testifying to her and uh, using the work of C.S. Lewis to bring her to Christ. So, yeah, I think that's great. Um, with that said, that's it. I will uh, go over to Harry Stark's edited uh, video of my own personal testimony and how I came to Christ. Um, and he's kind of uh, spruced up the PowerPoint slides, made it more a little bit more readable and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, enjoy the, um, uh, f the more fast-paced, shortened, and a little bit clearer visually uh, my, uh, uh, video of my own testimony on the Reason and Theology podcast. And have a great week. And, uh, yeah, and uh, next up, um, where am I? Oh, I will be on Saturday. I will be debating... Phil uh, Blase or Base uh, on the question: Can God lie? And I'm set to be taking the affirmative position. It is logically possible that God can lie. Um, we're going to be finding out that I, I'm wrong about that. Actually, I've changed my mind in the course of preparing for this debate. But uh, we're going to explore. I, I still have some issues with positing that it's logically impossible for God to tell a lie, um, meaning we have a capability that He doesn't and stuff like that. So. I'll work out some of my my issues and stuff like that uh, on this uh, discussion coming up on Saturday. Uh, if that doesn't get posted up, uh, I'm real seekers for this week. It'll definitely be up on Faith and Altar, and I'll post it up later on. But it's either that debate, or I will post up um, uh, my debate in the summer I did with the atheist Jimmy Tux. So, yeah, it'll just depend on uh, what I get in time. Um, but, yeah, the main thing will be the fill the discussion with Phil on the logical possibility of God telling a lie. Okay, over to my personal testimony in the edited form by Harry Stark. Thank you very much for doing that. Okay, bye. For those who recall, Dale is a longtime friend of mine going all the way back to my Protestant days. And we used to go to the same Reformed Baptist church, funny enough. And I remember for the longest time, he was actually a skeptic of Christianity. Like he was open to the faith, but he had a lot of questions. And he would um, pepper me and Tony Costa and our Baptist pastor with all his questions. And then he finally came to the Christian faith, which roughly coincided with the time that I left the Baptist church and became Catholic. I know, so, I know. <laughs> a story for another day. But... <laughs> Yeah, so here he's going to share some of his faith journey and the reasons for why he embraced the Christian faith. So yeah, my apologetics journey, obviously, as, as Lewis said, became agnostic. But before that, I, I grew up as a Christian uh, from childhood, um, always within the Protestant, um, Presbyterian and Baptist denominations. Um, so yeah, I, I believed uh, wholeheartedly in Jesus uh, growing up into my adulthood. And it wasn't even uh, you know a university thing. It was after I graduated university in my first job, uh, about a year after I started my first job at the World Trade Group in uh, sales. Um, and I encountered a Jehovah's Witness who was passionate about her faith, uh, her name was Shana, and she started sharing it with myself and some other uh, friends at work. And I felt to myself like, okay, well, if you're actually witnessing and stuff, I I'm going to actually should do that myself. So I started sharing my faith, encountering some of the Jehovah some of her beliefs, uh, talking about the Trinity and stuff like that. And it was during these discussions that a bunch of atheists, uh, this was a British company, so yeah, we had a bunch of atheists, and uh, they overheard it, and they, they started challenging me on other things about errors in the Bible, uh, creation and evolution and stuff. And at this time, I was a young Earth creationist. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't hear, I hadn't heard about a lot of the scientific details, so I started getting into discussions with them about my faith. And, you know, I, they would raise certain objections and that sort of thing, and I, I would raise to them very generalized knowledge about, you know, apologetics or positive reasons to believe, such as, you know, I'd vaguely known about Gary Habermas and Lee Strobel stuff and stuff like that. But it was around this time that I, I really started realizing that in terms of their objections, I couldn't just dismiss them. Um, in order to have a well-rounded or a warranted belief in Christianity, you need to have an understanding of the totality of the evidence, both the positive and the negative. And I had not really um, researched in depth the negative evidences and had an informed opinion on some of these topics. So yeah, one thing led to another, and because of that, I eventually kind of lost my faith. I realized that you can't, in order to be warranted, you have to look at all of the evidence, and you can't just look at one side of the issues. So yeah, that led into my period of being an agnostic. That only lasted for about six months. Um, and then after that, I became a general theist for the next eight years, as Lewis was talking about. And 
over that time, I was lucky enough to work with some of the great experts, you know, people like Dr. Tony Costa or Gary Habermas, especially were very helpful to me. Um, but even outside of Christian scholars, I was lucky and appreciative of people like Shabira Lee, uh, Keith Augustine, for example, who's an atheist. Um, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Tovaya Singer, I think was another one. He, he spent his entire afternoon at the airport helping me with my messianic prophecies questions and stuff like that. So yeah, I was very lucky to kind of work through the positive and negative evidences and uh, create a systematic method for studying these and putting it together to make an overall judgment, you know, which religion, if any, is true. And on May 5th, 2018, this is when I finally finished my research after eight years. And I realized there's a 53.14% overall probability that Christianity was true and all the other religions were below 50%. So at that time, I put my faith in Christ. And um, from there, I started a couple months later, I started up a show called Skeptics and Seekers with an atheist co-host named David Johnson. And, you know, each week we would write up a blog on a specific issue and then debate that topic on the podcast. Um, finally, from there, I branched out to doing my own thing, Real Seekers. And I've been doing that since about 2019, I think. Um, I've also been a co-host on other Christian shows, such as the Faith Unaltered podcast. So I know you guys, Lewis, you debated uh, David Russell, who's my friend, and he's a was the Protestant co-host of the Faith Unaltered podcast, um, along with Tyler Fowler, who's been on the show. Um, and I'm also co-host on the Theo Geeks podcast with David Russell as well. And I've done a bunch of guest appearances, such as uh, the Reason Theology channel. Um, okay, so to kind of summarize, I, I created an 11 premise or uh, deductive argument for the truth of Christianity or for God's endorsement of Christianity as the religion you wanted me to follow or humans to follow. And I'm not going to go through the argument itself just to save time, but just to kind of summarize the main elements of it. So basically the first part is I had to start with God exists. And by God, I mean a real maximally great being. He, he, has, he is a being that has all of the great making properties to the maximal calm possible degree. Um, Second, the second element, though, is it's not enough that God exists. He also has some goals because he is a free will being just like we are, and he cre chose to create the universe freely. So in order to make a, you know, there's a rationality condition in the libertarian free will notion. So he must have had a goal or a reason for why he created the universe and specifically human beings within it. Um, and I think that he wants as many human beings as possible to achieve that ultimate goal or that ultimate purpose. A way that he could do that is through divine revelation. Uh, he could reveal to us what our ultimate purpose is and how to achieve it. And that's typically what religions tend to claim to be. Um, however, there's a problem because there is confusion. Well, what religion is God's divine revelation? How, how do we know uh, what our goal is and how to achieve it? So on that front, God has to provide certain clarifying mechanisms. He has to clarify, okay, this religion, not the others. And how he would do that is where I get into my study of the Christian evidences on the positive side. So I, I invented the, this thing called the religion authenticating miracles. They're miracles that their specific goal is to authenticate this is the religion God endorses, not you know that the other religions or something like that. Um, finally, I also argue that it is impossible for God to provide religion authenticating miracles for a false religion or a religion that's not conducive for us achieving our ultimate purpose. Uh, so therefore, whatever is revealed by the Rams, we can have uh, confidence in in following. And finally, the last bit is it just so happens Christianity uniquely has these religion authenticating miracles and the highest overall probability above 50%. And so we can trust that God wants us to follow Christianity. Um, so that's in a nutshell. Here's just the argument in um, standard form. But um, okay, so religion authenticating miracles. I've put a lot of work into how do we identify miracles. And essentially philosophers and, you know, even Michael Kona and biblical scholars and apologists, there are usually three main elements, right? So number one, you have to prove an event took place so that, you know, that there's something that needs to be explained. The second is that it's, you know, they'll say it's supernatural in some way, or it's it's improbable to occur given natural laws. And then finally, it takes place within a context charged with religious significance. So I've kind of expanded on the, the two criteria here. And I said, we don't need to necessarily prove it's supernatural. It just needs to be extraordinary in some way. And there are three main ways that I think I can think of to do that. So the first is you can make a mechanistic type argument. So this is what we hear all the time, right? Like all the ordinary naturalistic mechanisms or explanations have been proven to be sufficiently improbable uh, to be explanations for a given event, right? So that this is where you know people like Gary Habermas and that they'll get into well the hallucination hypothesis that's improbable the the you know the conspiracy theory the, that's improbable and so that's kind of a mechanistic type argument. Um, the other way is through its uniqueness, the event's uniqueness, um, you know, and I say here, it has to be unique despite a sufficient opportunity for duplication. So for example, with the Shroud of Train images, one of the reasons I think the formation of those images is miraculous or extraordinary is because they're unique despite having a sufficient natural, right? I mean, how many millions of people have been buried in burial shrouds over the, the things, uh, the centuries and the only uh, imaged shroud that we have today is the Shroud of Turin. Or there's also artificial opportunities for duplication, such as the lab and field experiments done by scientists in the 20th and 21st century trying to replicate the shroud and failing. Um, finally, there's also extraordinary circumstances. So you, you could argue not the event itself is extraordinary, but the circumstances surrounding it. So perhaps an example of this might be in the timing. So with the nativity story, that you know, the three, I forget what it is, but there's a planets and stars, and they just happen to align uh, on Jesus, uh, you know, the day he was born. So in that case, the, I mean, stars align all the time in the heavens. There's nothing extraordinary about that. But the timing that it happened right at the moment Jesus was born, you might argue that's extraordinary. Um, okay, finally, in terms of the religion authenticating context, um, so basically there are three sub criteria here. So the uh, miracle or the event has to be sufficiently attached to the religious context, right? It has to be 
attached. So for example, the resurrection, that's obviously attached to the Christian religion. It's an essential belief of Christianity and that sort of thing. And it also has to serve to authenticate the religion. So in, in some way it's saying, hey, this is constituting proof that this religion is endorsed by God. And finally, thirdly, it can't be subsumable to another religion. So these are for miracle, uh, miracle cases when, let's say the virgin birth, right? Well, you might say, well, that proves Christianity, right? Well, it also uh, can be used to prove Islam because uh, Muslims believe in the virgin birth too. Or if you look at Moses parting the Red Sea, pretend we can prove that happened and it was extraordinary. Um, well, who gets it? Jews and Christians. And I think Muslims also believe in it as well. So this is the issue of subsumability. And my take on that is that the first religion chronologically to claim a given miracle is by default the one that gets it, unless the later subsuming religion, number one, can prove that the miracle isn't contradictory with its doctrines. Um, so, you know, some might argue, for example, well, the resurrection, that contradicts Islam because uh, Surah 4 says that Jesus didn't die and wasn't crucified. So Muslims couldn't subsume the resurrection, they might argue. Um, number two, the subsuming religion has its own independent religion authenticating miracle. And number three, the subsuming religion has an overall probability uh, of 50% and or higher than the uh, first religion to claim that miracle. Uh, so that's that's how I go about identifying miracles or these religion authenticating miracles specifically. Okay, cool. So let's get into well, what, what is it that converted me? And I said the, the first thing is I started out for a six month period uh, around 2009, 2010. I forget which year it was, but for six months, I was an agnostic. I had lost my belief in God. And, and eventually after that, thankfully, I became a general theist. Um, so what were the kind of arguments that really played a role in my realizing I do believe in God and becoming a general theist? So the, the first one is the modal ontological argument. It's, it's not popular in philosophical circles. It's frowned upon. But I think this is the st single strongest and best argument that uh, we have for general theism. Um, there was also the cosmological argument or contingency argument that played a role for me. Uh, the moral argument was one. And finally, I, I had my properly basic belief in, in God. And that was really strong as well. Um, at the time, there was negative evidences that I considered. So these were the three that I considered at that time, the problem of evil, uh, the hiddenness of God, and the internal incoherence of God. Um, so just kind of looking at the modal ontological argument, here are its, its premises, kind of as Elvin Plantinga puts it, um, and I qualify it, it's, it's an argument for a real maximally great being. So that's a bit different than Plantinga. And again, real max, the real there is, is from Yuji Nagasawa. And it's basically saying, look, it's a being that's got all the great making uh, properties. So that's the same as Elvin Plantinga and William Craig's version. But the real there is qualifying, but it has these properties only to the maximal com possible degree. Whatever that degree is, it has it. Um, so it, by that, on that front, when we're saying with premise one, it's possible that a real maximum great being exists. It's almost true by definition because we're just saying, well, you know, in terms of its properties, whatever degree is maximally com possible to have those properties together, then that's what the real maximum great being is. That's what God is. So it's almost true by definition there, I would say. Um, but yeah, there, there are four main types of objections to the ontological argument. Uh, you can try to deny its logical validity. Virtually nobody does that because it's easy to make a valid argument. Um, or they'll try to say, well, it's logically fallacious. It's, it's begging the question. And again, the, these kind of uh, appeals to fallacies have really been disproven over the years. Philosophers have done the work. They're, they're not begging the question or committing obvious fallacies. Um, you can also deny the soundness or truth of the premises. So on this front, most, most people will deny this first premise. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of atheists and scholars accept the truth of all the premises of this argument. It's only really premise one that they deny, the possibility premise. Um, so yeah, that's what most work is done today on is establishing, is it in fact ontologically possible that this real maximally great being exists? And it's important to note that this isn't just an epistemic possibility. It's not like, well, I'm, I'm dumb. So as far as I know, God exists. Yeah, it's possible, maybe. Uh, it's not an epistemic possibility. It's ontologically or metaphysically, is it possible for God to exist? Um, and then finally, the most popular objections are appeal to parody. So this was the very first uh, thing I think Thomas Aquinas himself gave the first parody argument, right? With the maximally great island argument, or you know, uh, some people appeal, well, there, maybe there's a maximally great pizza. I think that's Victor Stanger who says that. Um, there's also the quasi maximally great being. So that's, it's saying, well, it's possible that not a real maximally great being exists, but a quasi one. So he, he's God minus, as uh, T-Jump said, minus his, uh, he has no knowledge or intelligence at all. And that's what he calls the magic pineapple thing. It's, it's essentially a quasi maximally great being. It's just, it's a being exactly like God, but it has some kind of deficiency. So it's not, knowledgeable or powerful to the maximal degree and or it's missing one of the proper great making properties altogether and then finally you could say a real maximally evil being or the devil parodies um so that's how skeptics come back with that there's also the properly basic belief in god and i, I think this is how most people throughout history most people in the bible uh, have come to belief in god and also in, in christianity as we'll see later on it's not through objective argumentation or philosophical evidences and arguments and stuff like that um it's more about this subjective evidence uh given to us through or produced through our faculties like the census divinitatis and or, as I believe, I think the faculty that allows us to relate and know about God is the spirit within our souls. Um, so I take J.P. Moreland's position on the spirit versus soul. And uh, the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirits. And that produces immediately and intuitively within us this properly basic belief that yeah, God, God exists or Christianity is true or Jesus did rise from the dead, whatever the proposition is. And yeah, I think, you know, atheists and skeptics, I was on Pine Creek Doug's show and he tried to say, well, you know, this appeal to properly basic beliefs, this is, how do you distinguish it between a, a Mormon saying, well, they've got a burning in the bosom that, you know, X, Y, Z is true or something like that. And the point is here, I think William Craig makes it brilliantly, is look, counterfeit claims are meaningless. This is a subjective evidence, meaning I'm privy 
to my own properly basic beliefs and whether they're proper with respect to uh, the criterion for knowledge warrant or not. I'm not privy to some Mormon, you know, giving a claim that they that they also have the same thing. So I, I'm not obligated to believe them. I know internally that I'm warranted um, and I have no knowledge about whether they're warranted or not. So counterfeit claims don't do anything to disprove properly basic beliefs or anything like that. Um, okay, on the atheist side, um, I think when I went through my period of agnosticism, uh, really the problems of evil and divine hiddenness were huge for me. And uh, I would say more, I found out later is more on an emotional level, but just looking at them intellectually as well. Um, look, there's this issue, right? It's, you kind of have, okay, if evil or divine hiddenness exists in any certain form, then that means God does not exist. Premise two, well, evil and or divine hiddenness in the specified form obviously does exist. And then you conclude, therefore, God does not exist. This is kind of the underlying structure um, for all evil problems of evil or divine hiddenness arguments. And the flaw is the premise number one, right? This is obviously an unsound premise. And for me, I really uh, what clicked for me was Dr. William Lane Craig uh, and Mol learning about Molinism, which is a, originally a Catholic position. Um, but I think it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely true. And it was that that really helped me um, understand how God's providence, he could be sovereign and, and everything is working together for the ultimate good. Um, and yet we also are able to preserve our libertarian free will. God is not the cause or source of, of the evil or, or that sort of thing. We have, yeah, uh, we can explain any deficiencies in the world because of our free will. We freely choose to bring about the uh, evil and suffering and stuff like that in this world. So th through Molinism, that really provided me the sound mechanism to make sense of putting these two aspects together and realizing there wasn't a contradiction on that front. So that uh, totally changed my life when I, when I learned about Molinism. Um, okay, the, the other argument was the internal incoherence of God. So th this one says, well, look, God isn't contradictory with some external fact about the world, like evil or, you know, God's not uh, showing up in the way he should be. Instead of saying, look, just take God himself as a concept and internally his own attributes are contradictory or incoherent. So, you know, you have the age old question about God's omnipotence, right? So can God lift a rock that's so big he can't, uh, can he create a rock that's so big he can't lift it? Well, either way you answer, he's lacking a power. He either can make it and so he lacks the power to lift it or he can't make it, and therefore he lacks the power to create this rock. Um, but that's just totally illogical, right? Because logically contradictory things, they're not they are not things that exist. They're, logical impossibilities aren't, um, they're, they're not like a power that someone can lack um, and that sort of thing. So it's not a diminishment is what I'm saying. Um, God is essentially a logical being. And since God exists in every logical possible world, there are no, nothing external to him where logical impossibilities exist as though some, God lacks something. Um, and then there's, you know, where you go where there's two or more attributes conflicting with each other. So take God's omniscience and his moral perfection. So you, you might hear skeptics and atheists say, well, look, God, he's not, he can't be omniscient because he doesn't know what it's like to be a sinner or, and or the opposite. He's, he's imperfect. He's not morally perfect because he, he must know exactly what it feels like to be lustful or to sin or, or to be guilty or something like that. But again, these are logical impossibilities that you're appealing to. And I would just argue that, look, it's impossible. God, when we say he's omniscient, he knows all true propositions. Um, it's not to say that he has all experiential knowledge because that would entail logical contradictions. God is not a schizo. He doesn't have any clue what it, the qualia or what it feels like to be Dale Glover because I'm Dale Glover and I alone am Dale Glover. God is God. Um, it would be logically impossible for God to know he's God and that he's Dale. That doesn't make sense. That's a schizo. Um, or to, he doesn't know what it's like, feels like the qualia of being a sinner to experience doing a sin and stuff. That's an imperfection, uh, logically speaking. So that's kind of the, the answer of how we would address some of these internal incoherence issues. Um, okay, cool. So going from general theist to Bible believing Christian, and just to know how am I doing on time? Should I speed up or am I going good pace? Good pace for me. Good yeah. pace. Awesome. Keep up. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So great. So that's how we became a God, uh, uh, sorry, a believer in general theism. But then it took, after that six month period, it took about eight years uh, of my journey studying uh, the evidences for and against the various religions to figure out well, which religion does God want me to, find, uh, to follow? And as we know, I did in the end in 2018 become a Bible believing Christian. Um, so there are essentially four evidences that uh, convinced me on the positive side. There were four examples of religion authenticating miracles. Um, so the first was the formation of the Shroud of Turin's images, the body and bloodstain images. I co covered that in my last show a little bit as to why I think that. Um, secondly, there was also the historical evidence for the resurrection. I mean, my gosh, I studied with Gary Habermas. Of course, we talked about this uh, over and over again until I was blue in the face, right? So uh, yeah, I, I think that the, there's good historical evidence on a balance of probabilities. Uh, I think it was like 57.32% uh, in the end that from the appearance to the 12 specifically, that is uh, qualified, explained by a religion authenticating miracle. So it's interesting to note that I don't, unlike most apologists, I don't go for the cumulative case argument. And I don't, I, even though I think the other facts, like the empty tomb is a historical fact, the other appearances to the women, um, the appearance, uh, single appearance to Peter, the appearance to Paul, James, the appearance to the 500, I think that these are historical facts requiring an explanation. But on the explanatory level, I could think of an equally probable natural explanation. So it was only with respect to the appearance of the 12 that I, I was like, well, there isn't an equally probable natural explanation. This is a religion authenticating miracle. Um, th the other one, thirdly, was the vindication prediction argument, and I'll get into that when we get to it. And finally, my good old friend, the subjective properly basic belief produced by the inner witness or testimony of the Holy Spirit. 
And additionally, um, I haven't really done all the work to fin finalize it, but I think there may be a fifth example of a religion authenticating miracle from messianic prophecies. So in this case, I wouldn't be arguing directly, uh, you know, a fulfilled prophecy type argument. In this case, I would be arguing from extraordinary circumstances. It's a circumstantial argument. And essentially what it is, is I, I say, well, given the provable, uh, important and relevant messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, and given what the Gospels say about Jesus, so I, again, I don't have to prove that Jesus actually was or did these, fulfilled these uh, prophecies. I'm just saying, well, it's claimed in the Gospels, it's claimed that he fulfilled these. And that results in a weird circumstance where it's Jesus or bust. Either Jesus is the Messiah that fulfills these Messianic prophecies or no one is. And I think that's uh, unique. There, that circumstance doesn't come up in other religions where some prophecies might come about for something. And it's, it's totally unique. It's Jesus or bust. It's not Jesus Bar Kokhba or bust or Jesus and Jim Bob Jones or bust. Um, and I think that's kind of extraordinary. That We could argue that's an extraordinary circumstance because if it was naturally explainable and just random, why wouldn't we have five candidates? Why is it only Jesus is the only possible person to fulfill these messianic prophecies? So that's an argument I thought about, I haven't developed, but I think that could be a fifth example of a religion authenticating miracle. Um, okay, so uh, going on in terms of the negative evidences, there are four categories of negative evidences. So these are evidences that said Christianity is not the religion God wants you to follow and or is false. And obviously I looked at certain things, preservation problems, so lower textual criticism, you know, how is the Bible preserved over the centuries and uh, you know, does he allow scribal errors? How could that be allowed and stuff like that? Um, related to it is inerrancy issues. So these are more substantive errors and they go beyond just minor scribal issues and perhaps, perhaps were errors in the original autographs themselves. And just an example of something that I thought was an error at the at the time, uh, eight years ago or whatever it was. Um, you know, so for example, uh, the creation and the flood. Um, I thought the Genesis narratives, I thought it's clear Genesis teaches a global flood uh, if you take it literally and, and that sort of thing. And because there probably wasn't a global flood, I considered that an error, even in the original autographs themselves. It wasn't a preservation issue. Um, I've changed my mind on that issue since, um, basically through William Lane Craig's notion about uh, Genesis 1 through 11 being mytho-history genre. Um, so that issue's been solved. I no longer think it's an error, but just wanted to give you that example. At the time, I thought it was a historical, literal genre, and I didn't think it was true. Um, obviously, there's moral mistakes and misapprehensions. So these are errors of a specific kind, of a moral nature, things that depict God or his commandments for human beings as seemingly being immoral in some way. Um, and finally, we had other human factors. These, again, human factors, just arguments that make the Bible or God seem petty or not, not, it's not like it's inspired by God. It looks like it just comes from the hands of human beings living, you know, thousands of years ago who didn't know any better. Um, so that's what I would call the human factors arguments. Um, so yeah, so basically what I did, I plugged, I would assign my own subjective probability values to the various components of these t uh, categories of positive and negative evidences. And then I would plug that into Bayes' theorem to get my overall cumulative case. Where, where do I stand on the question? Is Christianity uh, true or not? And on, on that front, you know, it ended with me at 53.14%. And one thing I should say in terms of the negative evidences, I cheated against Christianity because I, you know, I, well, I grew up a Christian, so I probably have this unconscious bias that I want it to be true and that sort of thing. And um, because of that, uh, whereas other every other religion I studied, I went with the default, 50%, which is where, as the prior probability, that's what you should plug in given the philosophical principle of indifference, right? It, either it's true or it's not. It, there's an equal probability before you check out any evidence. But I assigned an automatic 95% against the truth of Christianity on the basis of the negative evidences. Uh, so it was it wasn't it was unrealistic. It was just me saying I'm going to put it to the maximum thing I think it, uh, that can be proven against Christianity. So that means there was only a prior probability of 5% that Christianity was true before before I even started looking at the positive evidences. And the amazing thing with that is that the positive evidences were so strong cumulatively that it even overrided that and made the 95% prior against it. And I, I came to faith. So that just is a testament to how strong the positive evidence is for Christianity. Uh, imagine if I had handled Christianity fairly, it would be way higher than 53. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, cool. So getting into some of the specifics. So the I mentioned the appearance of the 12 was evidence uh, that I thought was good. Um, so I Basically, when I was studying this, I had to establish it in the way any historian would. So what are the historical sources and the general reliability of those historical sources? Um, what about the specific facts within those sources can we establish using the criterion of authenticity that historians like uh, C.B. McCulloch would use? And yeah, I would use things like Paul's letters, obviously 1 Corinthians 15, those oral creeds, uh, the Acts sermon summaries, uh, even the Gospels. You know, Craig Keener, his book on Luke and Acts uh, was amazing. And I think he's convinced me a lot of the reliability of Luke Acts. And uh, Richard Bauckham's done work on the Gospel of John. But these were my sources. And I would extract, using the criterion of authenticity, certain facts relevant here. So. Um, uh, the first is that Jesus predicted his death and subsequent vindication or resurrection to his disciples. Uh, Jesus was indeed dead due to crucifixion. So, you know, I refute the swoon theory and that sort of thing. Um, and I say that at least a majority, six plus, of the main disciples or apostles had experiences that they believed to entail them seeing the resurrected Jesus after his crucifixion. So um, it's important here that I was being extra skeptical. I, I don't even need to establish that all 12 of the, or 11 of the disciples or apostles had this experience. I can establish my argument even if just the simple majority of them did it. 
um, and that sort of thing. And also I have to say that they claim to see Jesus. He was close up, not far away. So that would take care of an illusion uh, hypothesis. Uh, and they, it was in a recognizable form. Um, obviously that the recognizable versus not recognizing is an issue with other appearances and that sort of thing. But here with the appearance of the 12, I could establish it was in a recognizable form. And very importantly, it was in a non-glorious ordinary manner that Jesus appeared to them just like you or I appear. Uh, he wasn't glowing. He wasn't uh, crowned in majesty or or anything like that. And as we're going to see, that bit is relevant for one of the arguments for it being miraculous. Uh, and then finally, they, they saw Jesus either simultaneously or for my uh, one of my arguments, I don't even need that. It, what, uh, forget group appearances. Even if it wasn't a group appearance to the majority of the apostles, I can still prove um, that it happened within a relatively short period of time. And because of that, it is a miraculous appearance. Um, so what were my two arguments at the explanatory level? How did I establish these were this, these appearance, uh, this appearance and or appearances were religion authenticating miracles. And the first is that uh, based on the non-glorious nature. So essentially um, with the resurrection uh, back in the Jews belief back in the first century, this was an eschatological uh, claim or resurrection. And they pictured uh, the son of man coming in glory. Uh, you know, for example, Jesus at his transfiguration had a shine, was shining, shining face in this. And this is kind of what the Jews expected. Our, our, we would have glorious resurrection bodies. If Jesus was uh, raised from the dead by God, then he should have been raised gloriously to indicate his vindication. But yet the appearance to the 12, there's no mention of this gloriousness. And instead they just report seeing him uh, even with wounds and in an ordinary mundane fashion. And that goes against expectation. And because of that, this is a way of proving that the hallucination hypothesis is uh, unlikely or improbable because hallucinations uh, tend to be in accordance with our uh, psychological and socially conditioned uh, expectations. And even the social contagion factor would actually work towards supporting this argument. Because think about it, if let's say Peter or one of the apostles or a couple of them saw Jesus and hallucinated him in an ordinary fashion, but then you would say, but the others would probably ha see him in a glorious fashion. And due to social contagion, uh, them talking to each other, over time, the glorious resurrection appearance would take precedence, and that would be the traditions of the appearance of the Twelve in the Gospels. It's unlikely that the ordinary appearance would take over the majority of the, the apostles' glorious appearances. Um, and then finally, the, the other one was the, the one that Gary Habermas and Joseph Bergeron give, the, the improbability of having simultaneous group hallucinations. And that's, um, yeah, I, I, again, I consulted the some of the world's experts in hallucinations that Mike Lacona uh, did, and they confirmed to me what Mike says in his book as well. Um, so that was the appearance of the 12 argument. Um, there's also the vindication resurrection prediction argument. So this one's kind of unique to me, but I, I kind of use Mike Lacona's, his scholarly work, establishing that it's a fact that before Jesus died, he predicted either his resurrection or at the very least his supernatural vindication uh, after his death by God. And, you know, Mike Lacona, he provides about five to six reasons uh, that historians should conclude that, yeah, Jesus did in fact predict this. And since we can prove historically, and scientifically, if you include the uh, shroud evidence that Jesus did in fact probably rise from the dead, uh, thereby being vindicated supernaturally by God after his death, I think that the prediction itself must have been a religion authenticating miracle because it's, it's and, and this way we're doubly warranted by proving that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, we get double the warrant. Not only do we have the warrant for a miracle from Jesus' resurrection itself, but also from the fact that Jesus was somehow able to predict that the supernatural event would happen in advance. Um, so this is kind of a, a way of saying we get two miracles for the price of one. Um, so that's my vindication prediction argument. And interestingly, I did one show with my old atheist co-host, David Johnson on Skeptics and Seekers, and he actually agreed with me that, yes, if, if you could prove the resurrection and that Jesus predicted it this would in advance, this would count as an additional miracle. So even uh, the atheists were willing to grant me this as an additional um, double, war double warrant, so to speak. Um, okay, um, so Lewis asked me to cover my encounter with Islam. So my, one thing I left out of my testimony there is that back in 2017, there was actually a couple of months where it looked, it looked to me like Islam was true. And this was a, uh, a great test for me because I, I will admit emotionally, um, I didn't, I don't like Islam. I didn't want Islam to be true. And I see this as kind of a, God was kind of testing me. Look, are you, are you a real seeker? Are you honestly seeking truth? Well, if, if you are, and the evidence seems to be supporting Islam, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. You've got to follow the, God's truth. And because of that struggle, I finally overcame and I committed and I said, okay, fine, I'm going to complete my third round of study on the uh, evidences for Islam. And if it comes out that Islam is true, then I'm going to follow it and I'll learn to like it, so to speak. So, um, yeah, this was great because both Lewis and I were, we were friends uh, with Dr. Shabir Ali and I began working with him on the evidences for Islam. So we discussed a bunch of positive evidences for Islam, you know, the uh, scientific pattern, uh, scientific foreknowledge claims, prophecy claims, uh, the miraculous preservation of the Quran and, and all this stuff. And on the negative side, it was basically the same categories of negative evidence I used against Christianity. There were moral mistakes, preservation problems, stuff like that. Um, but at one point during these two months, it looked to me that all of the proof, those religion authenticating miracles for Christianity could be subsumed by the religion of Islam because I became convinced and still am uh, by Gabriel Said Reynolds who wrote a paper saying that uh, actually the Quran in Surah 4 doesn't contradict Jesus' death or resurrection. It's it's saying something else that's not contradictory there. And because of that, that removed the obstacle to sub Islam subsuming the evidence for the resurrection, the evidence for the shroud, which is again, evidence for the resurrection or Jesus' prediction. All, all of that could count towards Islam 
And additionally, it looked to me at that time that they had their own independent religion authenticating miracle from the numerical patterns in the Quran. And that was the one thing where I was starting to go, it looks like there may be something to this. And just to specify, it's, it, Shabir Ali gives five categories of number patterns. And so most, all four, the four of the five are, in my opinion, total garbage. You know, the miracle of seven, we find multiples of seven. This, there's nothing special about this. But there were certain patterns in here in the symmetric book or symmetrical patterns. And I was finding these convinced, starting to be persuasive and convincing. But thankfully, again, I had my process of doing three rounds of investigation. And um, it was at this point that I realized, look, this is essentially an intelligent design claim, right? It's saying these patterns, uh, they're not due to natural law. They're not due to random chance, but they're due to intelligent design. And who is the intelligent designer? Specifically, God, not human beings. And um, so, yeah, I, I totally agreed it, was, it wasn't due to natural law. And I agreed that it wasn't due to human design. That it's just impossible that a human being could purposefully have put these patterns in the 1924 Egyptian version of the Arabic Quran. Um, so there was only two options, random chance or intelligent God, divine intelligent design. And um, the way I assess that is through the criteria of William Debsky's specified complexity. And essentially, in order to, the problem with these patterns, I realize is, number one, Muslims don't do the hard work of proving, well, why are we specifying these specific patterns? And um, I, I won't waste time, but I had examples to show you maybe in the Q&A period. But, you know, like, for, for example, why, why are we specifying multiples of seven, just to keep it simple? Like, why seven? Why not multiples of six and that sort of thing, right? So the Muslims have to do the work of proving why are we specifying this and not just having fabrications where, well, we've discovered these patterns. So now we're specifying, well, see that these are obviously miracles. No, you, you have to specify independently of the patterns themselves. And secondly, and most importantly, there, there's a mathematical calculation. If you want to see if something is due to design versus random chance, there's a certain calculation. And the Muslims never do the math with the exception of one person, Cahill Seven, who he goes through, he gives you the basic probability simpler, simply, um, simple probability. So, you know, what's the probability that you get a multiple seven? Well, one divided by seven, right? And the more patterns like these multiples of seven you have, well, they, you multiply them and it gets lower and lower and lower until it's, oh my gosh, one in a billion chance that we would have these 50 multiples of seven in the Quran. Isn't that amazing? Um, but the problem is the Muslims never do the work of calculating out the available probabilistic resources. And there are two types, right? So there's replicational resources. So obviously the, the Muslims are replicating um, these patterns over and over again until they get a hit and they're just dismissing all of the failures. Um, well, you can't do that. You have to take account of those replicational resources, right? It's kind of like if you want to specify what's the probability I would roll a one on a dice or a die. Well, it's one six, right? But then, well, what's the probability if you can roll it twice and not just once? That's a replicational resource and that increases the probability. Um, likewise, there are things called specificational resources. So, you know, um, in, in the symmetric pattern, especially, these are complicated compound patterns. It's, it's not just, what's the probability we get a multiple seven? It's, well, what's the thing, uh, if we split the verses into even and odd surahs and then split it again into even and odd ayahs and, and then we count uh, the number of words and blah, 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 like it's a compound pattern. And each of these things adds multiple ways that you could have specified the pattern differently. And that will increase the odds that you will randomly just get a hit. Um, because again, you're just dismissing all of the other uh, specifications that didn't work and you're going with this one. So. That was basically what took me out of it is that the Muslims lacked an provable independent religion authenticating miracle because they're not doing the proper math uh, and following the formula that they should to take account of all the probabilistic resources. And therefore these number patterns are, are just due to random chance. You can't prove it's due to God's d divine design or something like that. Um, so yeah. Um, all right, so uh, now in terms of my use of Bayes' theorem, let, let me just ask, how, how am I doing with time? Um, should I rush through this or? I put you guys to sleep, I see. <laughs> Oh, no. You're fine on time. I'm fine. Okay, good. hopefully I didn't put you guys to sleep, but uh, okay, so I'll, I'll rush through the base here and then this will be the last thing in my presentation. So Okay, that's fine. Okay, awesome. So, so yeah, basically, like I said, I assigned subjective probability values to the various evidential components on the positive and negative side. Um, but then you come to this question, well, okay, how do you put it all together to make a cumulative judgment? And this is where uh, my use of Bayes' theorem came in because you plug those numbers in and out pops a number, an overall uh, cumulative total. Uh, for whatever you're assessing. And it's important to note, um, sometimes you don't need to calculate cumulative totals. So I, I didn't use Bayes' theorem for every premise. I would use it for certain ones when I required, when I had multiple lines of evidence, all cumulatively counting towards the truth of that premise. So for example, premise number one, God exists. Well, I named multiple positive arguments. You also have to take account of those multiple negative evidences for atheism. Or, or with uh, my other premise Christ about Christianity, having religion authenticating miracles. You, you have to take uh, account of the multiple uh, positive evidences, but also the multiple negative evidences. Remember those four cat preservation problems, uh, uh, inerrancy issues and stuff like that. And again, there's multiple evidences under each one of those categories too. Um, so Bayes is how I basically put it together. And essentially the formula is just, what's the probability that your hypothesis is true given the evidence and your background knowledge or background evidence. And here's the straightforward formula. So this is a conditional probability. So you have to ask, what's the probability that you would have the evidence you have, um, you know, whatever it is. So what's the probability that we would have uh, the data from the cosmological argument or ontological argument, given we assume God is God exists or that the hypothesis is true. And then you multiply that by the intrinsic or prior probability of the hypothesis on our background knowledge. Um, so, you know, for example, when you're arguing for the resurrection, obviously, uh, what's the prior probability of miracles? This is a huge area of debate on that front. 
And, and then you just divide it by the denominator. So this is the same as above plus one minus, right? So you're, you're doing the opposite. What, what is the probability we would have the same evidence given we assume the hypothesis is false? And what's the prior probability that the hypothesis is false? So this is just probability calculus. This is just the formula that you have to use. Um, so yeah, we can translate that into the resurrection hypothesis. So what is the probability that we would have the empty tomb and the appearance to the 12 and uh, you know the appearance of the women, whatever the evidential factors are, given we assume the resurrection hypothesis is true times the prior probability of the resurrection hypothesis. Um, and then the denominator, okay, the only thing we're adding here is well, that we would have the evidence of the empty tomb, the appearances, given the resurrection didn't happen. It's false that Jesus rose from the dead times the prior probability, the intrinsic probability that the resurrection is false. Um, so yeah, um, I'll skip over the odds form. This is just a different way of calculating in terms of a ratio uh, and comparing two specific hypotheses. Um, so you might use this. What's uh, the probability ratio between the resurrection being true, given the evidence, compared to the hallucination hypothesis, given the evidence? Um, so you're just comparing two specific hypotheses there. Um, one thing in terms of the prior probabilities, this is something that's important because I never see atheists get into this, but there is something called the Jeffrey conditionalization formula that can help us assess the prior probability of a miracle or a religion authenticating miracle. Um, so this is calculated by saying, well, what's the probability um, in this case of the resurrection miracle, given our background knowledge and assuming God does exist, times the prior probability that God exists on the background knowledge, um, plus what's the probability that the resurrection is true given the background knowledge and God doesn't exist. So it's it's saying, well, maybe he rose naturally. What's the probability of that? Um, and then what's the prior probability that God doesn't exist? Um, so atheists and skeptics like Bart Ehrman, the, they always like to focus on this half of the thing and say, well, this is very low. It, I mean, a one in trillion chance that some someone would naturally rise from the dead or just randomly or something like that. But they always ignore this part of the equation, right? Because um, the prior probability that Jesus would have risen from the dead, given God exists and the background knowledge, and I would include in this, um, you would have to include a divine psychology component, right? That he would, and not only does God exist, but he also has a sufficient religious motivation for raising Jesus from the dead. Well, then that raises the, the probability quite a bit. Um, it would be virtually 100%, you might even say. Um, so yeah, the, just bear in mind that there is a, a formula for actually count, calculating the prior probabilities of miraculous events. And atheists typically just want to focus on this or maybe even this, but in debates like Bart Ehrman, he just focused on this factor. That's irrelevant because we have this side of the equation where we assume God does exist. Um, okay, uh, cool. So I mentioned, Lewis, that I use a Bayes-ish approach. Um, so there's a difference. I don't use the proper Bayes theorem formula because if you see here, this remember, this should be, um, uh, sorry, yeah, this is the proper formula, the conditional probability that we would have the evidence of the empty tomb or appearances given the resurrection is true. But instead, I just do a simplistic subjective direct probability, right? Like what I think that the resurrection, given the empty tomb evidence, I think it's 60% proven the resurrection happened directly. Uh, from that evidence, or the appearance of the 12, I'm 70% uh, proven that the resurrection is true. So it's it's a more simplistic, intuitive way for, for people that aren't mathematicians and don't want to get into conditional probabilities. You're just asking, well, look, I have this bit of evidence or this set of evidence, evidence is plural. What's the probability that those evidences directly prove that the resurrection is true in my estimation? And that's what I would assign as my subjective probability values total for the, res the appearance of the 12, the sh shroud of trans images, um, the vindication prediction argument, and et cetera. And I would plug that into Bayes plus the prior probability, which I set as the default uh, 50%. Um, because again, um, without any evidence, in the absence of evidence, you always follow the principle of indifference. And in Bayesian terminology, 50% doesn't affect the calculation. It's either true or the hypothesis is either false. There's an equal likelihood. Um, so that that's why I would just assign 50% here. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully that will make sense in terms of the difference between Bayes proper, where it's a conditional probability of the evidence, given we assume the resurrection happened, versus what I did. I just said, well, given the evidence, I think the probability that the resurrection is true is 60% or whatever value I was able to get to on that front. Um, okay, cool. So this is the final slide. It's just an example. So let's say the hypothesis is God exists, um, and we have the, the cosmological argument at 65%, the ontological argument at 90%, and the moral argument at 75%. And then you have the negative evidences for atheism, and you assign the problem of evil 70%. These are just made up numbers, by the way. Um, hiddenness of God, 95%. Um, so doing that, you have to convert it into positive terms because the hypothesis is God exists, not God does not exist. So that means given the problem of evil, there's a 30% chance that God exists given the problem of evil. And there's only a 5% probability God exists given the hiddenness of God, again, for, for the sake of argument. So, okay, great. You plug all of those figures in, all of the positive evidences, as well as the negative uh, evidences against God. And we have the 50-50 prior, I would argue, for, for that hypothesis. And then that comes out to 53.85. Therefore, you should believe God exists, probably exists.